Okay, we've got a reading this morning. It's from 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 11 this time. John writes, For this is the message you heard from the beginning, we should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, We know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask, because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Hear the word of the Lord. Life or death. Isn't John just great? It would be a mistake to take John completely literal, wouldn't it? It would contradict much of the scriptures. But it would also be a mistake not to heed his warnings and to listen to what he's got to say. There's about 10 things we could kind of unpack from that passage. I'm going to do nine of them. No, I'm going to do maybe three. But first up, what do we got? Well, the Sydney Morning Herald this week quoted the renowned surgeon Charlie Teo allegedly saying to one family, surgery tomorrow or she accepts death. It was a promise that saw the family out of pocket some $250,000 and left this patient in a living hell for her remaining 94 days. The money was of no concern to the family. They were prepared to pay whatever he asked with a glimmer of hope that his silver tongue offered. The story is nothing unusual in that it's like pretty much every story these days in that it's always about extremes. Life or death, extinction or a future joy, depression... And unless we're prepared to kind of agree with, to choose their view, then we, my friends, we're on the wrong side of history, destined for the scrap heap. Or worse still, we'll be accused of killing grandma or causing a gender-confused teen to commit suicide with our prayers. Now, the question for us today is this. Is the Apostle John another Charlie Teo, offering false hope? through the extremes of life and death? Is he yet another charlatan selling us a new way, a a secret that they have that if we receive it, if we believe it, it'll bring long life, hope, joy, and lots of sugar or something? Beautiful things. Well, in a word, no. No way. Unlike Charlie and the news cycle of our day, John is preaching to himself. If he was Charlie Teo, not only would he be prepared to operate on himself, but he would foot the bill as well. Our John, he always puts his money where his mouth is. And he gives us at least three things today. Firstly, choose life and believe in Christ. He tells us to choose the way and don't be led astray. And he says to choose his word. And don't be a turd. <laughs> it rhymes. What kind of stuff? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your great love. 
Help us hear your word, heed your word. Help us to receive you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, choose life, believe in Christ. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. It's not rocket science, is it? Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Don't be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. First things first, the Cain and Abel story is found in the book of Genesis, and it is a brilliant example, not of something that happened all those years ago, although it did happen, of course, but it's an example of sin and the human heart and the trajectory of jealousy. Now, even as an agnostic, Jordan Peterson, he does a series of lectures on these stories, particularly the Cain and Abel one, and they are fantastic, worth searching YouTube for. But more importantly, John is directing this at us Christians. Those who have heard the message and believe. And to them, to us, he's addressing what well, may well be the greatest danger that faces every Christian community. Fake friends is one. It's jealousy. Jealousy. Jealousies often pictured, pictured as a green-eyed monster. And that's because it has the potential to be a monster. And once it's kind of set loose... It just wrecks the joint, and it's difficult to contain. See, jealousy leads to all manner of sin. And what's worse is it kind of tends to eat us up inside until we find a way to justify ourselves. And ultimately, we leave nothing in the way of this monster and the sin that it just smashes the place with. For Cain, it was to murder his brother. Now, I, I wouldn't expect anyone here to have a jealousy that leads them to murder, but then again, John is about to say that simply to hate, to not love a brother or sister in Christ is no different to murder. Murder of the heart is murder indeed. Verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. And anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. It's very similar to what Jesus had to say about looking on upon, upon another in lust and how it's no different to actually the act of adultery. As Christ followers, we are born again. We are born of the spirit and not of the flesh. Our new nature is one of purity and obedience to Christ. And not one of sin and jealousy, hatred, or even murder, murder from the heart. But at the same time, John's not saying that Christians are not incapable of hatred and murder. Even the great King David, he murdered a friend so he could have his wife. And yet he is still counted amongst the righteous. In fact, the scriptures detail prophet after prophet criminal after criminal, all choosing life by believing in Christ. So if you are a sinner who has decided to follow Christ, you are in good company, my friend. But just like last week, we must not water this down. We must not water down what it means for us to continue to hate, to, to be unloving towards brothers and sisters. For Romans 8, this is Paul speaking, says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And Jesus himself says in Mark, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. On one hand, choose life, believe in Christ. But on the other hand, there is still deception and jealousy and murder. And there are those of us who would seek to lead us down that path. So choose the way. Don't be led astray. Verse 16. This is how we ought to know what love is. The alternative to all that other stuff, the Cain and Abel story. Love is Jesus Christ laying out down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This is the clear alternative to being led astray with jealousy like Cain. It is to champion those we are jealous of. The alternative to being led astray by our jealousy and letting out this green-eyed monster is to champion those we are jealous of. 
But I'm not jealous. I'm not jealous of anybody. Why am I harping on this? Well, I beg to differ. Why? Because jealousy is really insidious. We rarely internalize our feelings and actions as jealousy. It's at the root cause of so much sin, and we often look at what's up here and forget where it came from. The proof's in the pudding, isn't it, though? When we find ourselves speaking negatively about other Christians, the proof's in the pudding. Or more broadly, when we discover we're just buying stuff because other people buy stuff, stuff that never satisfies us. The way to guard our hearts from this is to champion, to encourage other Christians. I know it sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? To champion those we are jealous of, to raise up their gifts, to lay down our lives, to support them, to hold up the gifts of those we're jealous of. It just kind of goes against everything the world teaches. It almost grates on us, doesn't it? Surely by praising them, we're going to make them proud and conceited. They will never learn their lesson. They may even take advantage of us like a bad boss in the workforce, perhaps. But even if all of that is true, surely that's a better outcome than to let our own monsters out. Monsters that threaten the whole community and ourselves. So let me put it this way. Let God deal with their sin. And you deal with yours. Now tell me, who's the first to apologize during a conflict or a fight with a friend or a family or a spouse? Who's the first? Well, it should be you and me. We should be first. Let God deal with their sin. Let us deal with ours. And as always, what we believe must change the way we walk. And our walk with Christ, our way in Christ, it involves much more than the spiritual. Verse 17, if anyone has material possessions, John's getting practical, and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and truth. I know you know this, right? But let me say it again. Love is not love. Love is not a self-defining prophecy. Love is not a feeling. Love is action. Love is doing. Love is practical. It's always something we do. And our good works, they reveal our love. They reveal our faith to others. This is how we show and how we know the true character of our hearts our innermost being. But how much doing is enough? How many rosters must I be on? How much work must we do? Well, John answers this question next. Verse 19. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. First kind of thing is our good works should bring rest. That should bring a sense of perhaps accomplishment. And not what comes next. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. He knows everything. Now, I don't know about you, but it can feel like the needs of others are a never-ending story. And we can feel so guilty when we don't do enough. To you, John is saying, you've actually got this wrong. Good works are not done to ease our guilt. Good works are not done to impress others. Good works are a response to the love of God and the good work that he did for us. Good works should not be done from guilt. They should not bring guilt. For guilt is not not of God. I'm starting to wonder if anyone's going to sign up for the roster next week. I guess the point is this. Do the good stuff, please. But don't let it be because of guilt. If guilt is our motivation, then our motivation is not from God. And it's not difficult to join the dots between how this will end up for us and how it will end up for the ministries we support. So verse 21, with hearts responding out of love and in love for the good of the other and not from guilt, 
John says, dear friends. When he says, dear friends, he's speaking more to himself. This is John preaching to himself as well as us. If our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him everything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. There's at least two ways to look at this. Firstly, there's those who are doing good works to get something in return. Well, to you, John, saying you'll never get what you seek. But then he's saying to those who are doing good works out of love, you're going to receive it all. Well, let me put it this way. Choose his word, don't be a turd. And God's word, it says that we're loved. We are children of God. It says that we have a, a new confidence to approach God through his sana, a confidence that allows us to ask him for anything. Yet, as long as we feel like the other thing, or at least act like it, we're not going to step up. As long as we carry the jealousy of Cain, we will forever feel unworthy of God's grace and mercy. And our good works, that would just bring bitterness and resentment. It will never be enough, as was Cain's offering in the book of Genesis. We may even fall away from the faith, although we will likely think we were pushed out. Choose his word, verse 23. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Everything so far has been more about wisdom and foolishness. This is doctrine. This is John making clear what's important for our faith. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gave us. Now, blink and you'll miss it, but that's the first time John's mentioned the Holy Spirit in the whole book. We have just two chapters to go. That's the last verse of chapter 3. He's going to talk about the Holy Spirit six more time, five more times in the remaining two chapters, but he hasn't mentioned it not once. We have covered so much, haven't we? And that's the first time the Holy Spirit's come up. It's a bit odd. It certainly struck me as odd. I mean, Paul in the book of Ephesians, it's front and center. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Well, John, he begins with Jesus. He begins with the word of life. And here it's almost as if his rework, Jesus' summary of the Ten Commandments. You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Yet he's kind of changed it to believe in Jesus and love other Christians. But is it a change? Is it, or is it just a smaller step? to a bigger picture? Or is it just a different focus for a different audience? Well, you'll have to come back next week to find out. What have we discovered today? Jews' life, believe in Christ. It's not alarmism. John's not trying to manipulate us like a common journalist. Instead, he's expressing the reality in which we live, a reality that has cost him dearly. But why the cost? Why were his friends killed? Why were they marginalized, murdered, and persecuted for saying such a simple, seemingly harmless thing? Well, the truth, when pushing against a machine as big as Rome, tends to do that. And it's no different for us today. For Christians are the most hated, most persecuted people group to this day. It's true. We're starting to see this more blatantly, even in our own country. Look, it appears to me you can be anything in, in the media or in leadership or in the government or in football but a Christian. Not to mention this story of the, this week of the rescued Muslims. I mean, we risk everything to rescue a few Muslims trapped in Syria, largely as a result of their own choices, but take... <laughs> busloads of Christian girls kidnapped by Boko Haram, nobody lifts a finger. Hardly makes the news, does it? Busloads, teenage girls taken from their schools 
into slavery and servitude doesn't even make the news. I know from the outside this whole Christian thing doesn't sound like much of a lie. But make no mistake, Christ is the truth that sets us free. Christ is the truth that sets us free. Choose his way, don't be led astray. John's focus is always on the word. The word was God with God, the word was God. For it is the word that guards our hearts. It is knowing his word that reveals the false teachings to us. The mistakes our consciences make about the world around us. His word reveals the false teachers. And this is so important. John wants us in this for the long haul. Now I went to that mighty gospel, gospel, mighty gospel tent gathering this past week on Monday night. Yeah, it was very 1980s Pentecostal, which is okay. I'm getting a laugh in the background. It may be your thing, getting slain in the spirit every other day, but not so much mine. Yes, I've got a lay on of hands, I pray in tongues, trust God for miracles. I've seen miracles. I've been a part of that. It's a wonderful way God grows his community, his church, his people, shows his love. Now, the preacher did do something that surprised me, I must admit. At least one thing before waving his arms and half a dozen people fell over. I'm not jealous. I'm not jealous. He said, most Pentecostals' knowledge of the words about this deep. That's what he said. And I think he said this as a cry out to those who are coming back night after night seeking an experience rather than the word of God. Those who come back night after night for the circus instead of the bread of life. Friends, we must always seek the face of Jesus not his hand. The gifts of the Spirit are exactly that. They're gifts. They're given to different people in different measures for the building up of his kingdom. And as far as this big gospel tense concerned, we must withhold judgment and, dare I say it, jealousy when we see such things coming out of our Christian brothers and sisters, out of their communities, out of their churches. God can do that. He just hasn't done it for me, and that's okay. What matters is we seek him. What matters is we seek him and all else will be given to us. And lastly, choose his word. It rhymed. What more can I say? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your great love. Thank you for your word. Help us to live our lives by it. Recommit us, Lord Jesus, to reading your scriptures every day. Give us hearts that desire the building up of other Christians. And we thank you for including us in your kingdom, regardless of the cost. In Jesus' name.